Well, welcome. I'm Dr. Larry Robbins of the Robbins Headache Clinic. We're a little bit north of Chicago in Riverwoods, Illinois. Our website is chicagoheadacheclinic.com. And we will be putting a series of lectures on uh, about difficult to treat headaches, about migraines, about various headache type topics. And today's talk is the first part of refractory or difficult to treat chronic migraine. Firstly, defining refractory or difficult to treat. About 14 years ago, I started the section of the American Headache Society called the Difficult or Refractory Headache Patient. And we've spent over a decade trying to define what is refractory. Chronic migraine itself is at least 15 days a month of headache for at least two or three months. So refractory, difficult to treat chronic migraine is those people where the preventives, the daily preventive type medications, which include usually Botox, have not been helpful. Uh, for a long time, we struggled with how to uh, define this versus uh, abortive uh, failures, preventive failures, and it looks like the Europeans have the best idea to, ref uh, to define refractory headache based on preventive failures. Also, most people have failed on non pharmacologic non-medicine treatments, and we try everything, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, from psychotherapy to physical therapy uh, to exercise to watching triggers. So, of course, everybody uh, generally tries all of that. Medication overuse headache also plays into this, and I take a contrarian view to a lot of doctors. Uh, medication overuse headache, or MOH, is a big subject. Many feel that it's the main contributor to daily headaches and refractory headaches, but I really feel that uh, it's overblown and I'll get into the definition of medication overuse headache. The diagnosis is one thing. Um, it, it brings also into it the role of disability. If people are disabled, does that make them more refractory? And if we look at disability, uh, it's actually very complicated. There's a lot of factors that go into disability, not just pain level. Uh, people think, well, I have a 10 out of 10 pain or 12 out of 10 horrible, so of course I'm disabled. But if you look at people um, who are disabled and what predicts disability, actually catastrophizing uh, predicts disability, fear of pain. Catastrophizing is where everything is the worst. You ask people how your pain is on a scale of 1 to 10, it's always a 12 or a 14. It's always horrible, the sky is falling. Fear of pain comes in there. So pain level is just one. Resilience comes in, and I'll talk about resilience in a little bit. Uh, there are biomarkers for chronic migraine, possibly, where in the spinal fluid, in the blood, and on MRI machines, we may find differences that define people with uh, migraines. We see differences in the amount of brain tissue. We see differences in what we call the white matter of the brain in people with chronic pain. So this, it's not a psychological problem. Headaches are not psychological. Chronic migraine is very physical, and refractory chronic migraine is very physical. When we look at chronic migraine, I like to look particularly at, uh, with refractory migraine, at severity. There are mild people who are mildly refractory. Maybe somebody, uh, a 22-year-old with a year of difficult headaches where nothing's worked versus moderate or severe, uh, a 50-year-old who's had 40 years of headache where absolutely nothing has worked and they've tried everything and they have multiple other problems, psychological problems, medical problems. And treating these are different. We'll treat a 22-year-old with milder uh, refractory difficult headaches differently than a 50-year-old where absolutely nothing has worked. Now, refractory chronic migraine can also change over time. It can go back to Regular migraine where it's easily, more easily treated, it can go to episodic. People sometimes flip between episodic headaches, which are less than 10 or 15 days a month of headache, and chronic migraine. And at different ages, age is a crucial uh, determinant of where we go with medication. So at age 12 and 14, our medicines can approach different than age 20 to 25 versus 40 to 45 versus in the 60s, and then in the 80s and 90s. And the elderly, actually, in the 80s and 90s, are uh, 
uh, we frequently see severe headaches in that population. Sometimes it starts at age 80. Of course, I've defined uh, headaches in the elderly differently. I wrote a, uh, a book when I was 35 on uh, treatment of headache, and I had a chapter in there, Headaches in the Elderly After Age 50. And now, as I get older, of course, I move my definition of elderly up, and now it's up into the 70s and 80s. But we do see a lot of uh, headaches in young kids, more in adolescents, and in the elderly. Medication overuse headache, I think, is poorly defined. According to the official definitions, people have medication overuse headache if they take pain medicine 10 or 15 days a month or triptans like Imitrex or Zomig more than 10 or 15 days a month. So it's based on how much medicine people are taking. But there's no determination whether they're actually getting medication overuse headache, the headache from the overuse of the medicine. So they may be getting what we call medication overuse, MO, without medication overuse headache. And there are epidemiologic studies on this where they'll look at 100,000 people and determine so many people get medication overuse headache. But I think that you need really to take each individual patient and determine what's happened with their medicine, their headaches, take them off of the medicine like Excedrin and the other painkillers and see what happens with their headaches to determine that. So we can't really do population-based epidemiologic studies with medication overuse headache. I don't think it really works. There's also new daily persistent headache, NDPH, where people are fine, they don't have much in the way of headaches, they wake up one day and over 24 hours, or they'll be walking around and all of a sudden they get hit with a headache and it's there for months or sometimes years or a lifetime. NDPH is very difficult to treat. Sometimes it's from a virus, sometimes it's from a head injury, sometimes it's from a surgery or a stress. But it's not that uncommon to have a 42-year-old, very healthy, they may have had headaches as a teenager and then they went away, and all of a sudden they wake up one day and get severe daily headaches, and those are tougher. What's easier to treat is what we call transform migraine, where people have one headache a month when they're 12, and then two or three when they're 16, and four headaches a week by the time they're 22, and all of a sudden they're having chronic daily headache and 24-7 by the time they're 27 or 30. That's actually easier to treat than nuance at daily or post-traumatic where people are rear-ended or hit their head or have a post-concussion. Sometimes these are the toughest headaches to treat. There's this entity called central sensitization that's very important in refractory chronic migraine. Central sensitization means that the brain is constantly firing and creating headaches on its own. There are other central sensitization syndromes and illnesses that are linked to headache. Fibromyalgia, we have chronic pelvic pain, irritable bowel syndrome. Serotonin is a key chemical, neurotransmitter in all this, and most of our serotonin is in our stomach and our GI system. So irritable bowel, where people have diarrhea or constipation, or it doesn't work one way or another, cramps, is very common in people with headaches. So fibromyalgia, uh, irritable bowel are seen very often. TMD, where people have jaw pain and clenching, is very common. And the mistake is to say that TMD or TMJ, they used to call it, is just a problem out in the muscles. It actually starts more in the brain and the nervous system. So it's linked to chronic headaches. Genetics play a big role in refractory chronic migraine. If both parents have headaches, one of the kids often has very severe headaches. So it's how much of the gene people get. Uh, everything is the genetic lottery. Our intelligence, our looks, our headaches, our stomach issues, our low back pain, very much is genetics. Uh, generally, most things are probably 70 or 80% genetic, uh, which is nature and nurture. So that's nature and then nurture, the first 15 years of life is 20 or 25% or so, depending on the, the, the condition. So. That's true with anxiety and depression as well, too. And then as people go on with chronic pain, as I mentioned, they get structural problems in the brain, mostly in the white matter. We can do certain experimental scans, such as a type of MRI, functional MRI, or DTI, and see how different areas of the brain are working or not working. 
Now, does medication overuse headache change the brain? If people take six Excedrin a day or they're on eight furanol and some codeine every day, it may actually change the brain where people need that medicine all the time or that's the only medicine that helps and that's a problem. Then there are psychiatric comorbidities, psychological comorbidities we call it, or comorbidity means what else is going on with a person. So we have anxiety, we have depression, do these long-term change the brain and create more headaches or go along with headaches? Now, the scale that I use for refractory chronic migraine, and I've published on this, um, we've published a lot of articles out of our office, about 250 or so, and uh, uh, four books. Uh, the latest is Advanced Headache uh, Therapy. That's aimed at doctors, but many patients have uh, read this book. I really write simply enough. I write so that patients can understand. And I talk about refractory scales, mild, moderate, and severe, and everything that goes into saying that somebody is more severe than another person. Medication overuse headache, does it really contribute? How much does it contribute to uh, refractory headaches? This is still debatable. I think it's important, but it tends to be overblown. What happens is People go into the doctor's office, the neurologist, they go to the big clinic, and whatever they come in on, they're told, this is why I have headaches, uh, or this is why you have headaches. You're taking too much Excedrin, you're taking too much painkiller, and you have to go off that. And people say, well, I had headaches way before I took this medicine. I don't think that's true. And the other thing is people are told to go off of their painkiller, go off of their triptan, their Imitrex every day. And the second half of the sentence I call it is not answered. Well, what do I take? What can I take when the preventives aren't working? When we look at preventives for headache, it's not as if we have terrific preventives. We have the heart medicines like beta blockers. We have Topamax, et cetera, and the antidepressants. But how many people do they really work long term with? I've done a couple of studies on this where we looked at over a thousand people long term. And long term, I think that we only get about 46, 48% of people do well long-term. So at least half the people don't find a preventive, including Botox, which is our best preventive, that works. And what do all those people do? We're talking with refractory chronic migraine, millions of people in the country, at least three or four million people minimum. Statistics and studies show probably more people than that. And since the preventives don't work, they scramble around to take Excedrin or Imitrex, and I'll talk about some of the possibilities later on in the other parts of this talk uh, about how we approach them as an outpatient and not having to go in the hospital and what we can do. So the definition of medication overuse headache I've talked about is inaccurate. I think it's overblown. Uh, addressing medication overuse is not easy. If somebody's on eight a day of something and it's working, or they, it helps their anxiety, it's not always easy to get people off. So that's a very difficult uh, situation. And if you look six and 12 months later, many people are back on whatever they were taking. But if somebody is on six, et cetera, in a day, or a lot of painkiller, or certainly daily opioids, it's worth trying to get them off and seeing off of that medicine and seeing if, if people are having medication overuse headache. Now, outside of medication, we want to minimize medicine. It, it's crucial. So I always say it takes a village to raise a person with severe pain. And we get other villagers involved. Who are they? Well, psychotherapists, if it was up to me, probably everybody in our society would see a psychotherapist for a year or two. It's a good thing. But because of money, time, it used to be stigma. Oh, no, I can't see a therapist. But now that's not so much. It's more money, insurance, time. People don't see a therapist, but it can help with anxiety or depression. So we refer a lot to psychotherapy. Physical therapy, some, a lot of people with headaches have neck pain or neck tightness. About half the people with headaches, their neck is constantly tight or it feels like a rock. So we refer to physical therapy very often. Massage can help, but often it only helps for a day. Sometimes it's really worth it, though. Acupuncture occasionally, although the studies on acupuncture are iffy. Uh, most are negative. Some of them uh, are okay, but at least it's safe and outside of medicine. Exercise. We try to get everybody exercising 15 or 20 minutes a day. I, I like stationary bikes at home. 
I like the Garmin Fitbit, which uh, you don't have to recharge. So it's funny, I separate after age 50 or so when people are not so technological, I get the Garmin uh, Vivo Fit because it's easy and you can just read it off here. And under a certain age, uh, the Fitbit, which is a little more complex and uh, you have to recharge, uh, is better. So I, I go for different ages. But I like stationary bikes. They're the most used piece of equipment at home. Uh, treadmills tend to be just good clothes hangers and ellipticals in the middle. But I shop for stationary bikes for people where they can put their laptop or they're reading it or a newspaper. People under age 30, I explain, the newspaper has like print on it and that's what, um, but most people put their laptop on it and where you, walk, you can watch TV. And then people say, well, you're still sitting on a bike. Is it really exercise going slow and low watching TV? It is. You're engaging your core. And speaking of core, I like Pilates, even a few minutes. I found my whole Pilates class on YouTube. So you can find almost everybody, everything exercise-wise on YouTube. So we push little bits of exercise. The old way, uh, oh, you have to go for an hour and get your heart rate up. And you got to go to the club. It inhibits most people. So the people I'm preaching to the choir about with exercise, it's fine. You know, they're exercisers. But the other 80% who don't do much, we're trying to get them to do something, even five or 10 minutes of anything. Uh, yoga is also good. Mindful meditation is good outside of medicine. Mindful meditation is easier than the, the old way they taught meditation was you have to clear your whole brain out for an hour. You have to get everything out of your head. It's too difficult. We, we try to make it a lot easier. And biofeedback is still used where you work on hand warming or muscle tension and seeing a biofeedback therapist can be useful. So outside of medicine, I, I touched on catastrophizing. We try to dial the catastrophizing dial down and have people not all of a sudden go zero to 60 in five seconds. Uh, this is the worst. This is the most horrible. I also call it catastrophizing by proxy. A parent will say, how can a 16-year-old have daily headaches? How can a 16-year-old have frequent migraines? Well, it's common and it happens, and let's not get so crazy about it. Resilience is an interesting construct, and with resilience, uh, there are genetic factors. You can look at the serotonin gene, uh, which you can't look at, but uh, under a microscope, and, uh, and predict how resilient people are gonna be in general based on the shape of the serotonin gene. So there's the long arm of the gene and the short arm. And if people get from their mom or their dad, Two long arms, that's pretty good. Two short arms is not good. So people may be fine if they don't have much abuse or stress as a kid, even if they have two short arms. But if they do, they'll tend to have major problems with either headaches and pain, psychiatric issues. If they have two long arms, they're more resistant to stress as a kid, and they may do very well. So if you look at kids who have had moderate or severe abuse as a child, who do extremely well later on, almost always they have two long arms of the serotonin gene. Interestingly enough, they've done prospective studies on monkeys who have two long arms of the gene and give them stress growing up, and they tend to be uh, pretty good monkeys. If they have two short arms and the monkeys are raised without a mom and they're raised by the other adolescents, they tend to be what we call borderline personality monkeys, which they're hissing, they're biting, they're spitting, they're sitting in the corner. They're asocial. So resilience does have a genetic construct I'm talking about. Also nurture, the first 12 years in modeling in life. So a lot of factors go into resilience. But we see a lot of people who have mild or moderate headaches who are on disability, and other people who have severe daily 24-7 pain who work 70 hours and uh, work, run a law firm, for instance. So I think we'll stop here and uh, So we've been talking in the first part of this refractory talk about all the non-medicine aspects and the psychological aspects and what goes into and defines refractory chronic headache. In the second part, we're going to talk about actual treatment, uh, five main ways that uh, we, we treat people as an outpatient. And later on, we'll have many other uh, talks and lectures and material on all aspects of headache. Thank you.